the eagle-eyed people amongst you will have spotted that I've had this exact car on the channel before. But much like our phones these days, cars can suffer from software glitches. And this car had lots of them the last time I filmed it. The reverse camera didn't come on. There was lots of errors and bugs on the screens. So I said, how about we get this updated and I'll have a look at it then. And that's what I'm doing today here on Nobby on Cars. This is the Cupra Born E-Boost. For that, what do you get? Well, an extra 26 brake horsepower to be exact. A lot more standard stuff like sport suspension, the upgraded 19 inch alloy wheels, the bucket seats, blind spot. A lot more stuff comes for the price, but the price is not cheap. It's 60,000 euro. And that's quite a lot more money for a car that really you can still get in this color. You can spec these wheels. It's a lot of extra cash for what looks like pretty much the same car. So by the end of this video today, we'll have discovered should you just buy a standard Cupra Born or not. A couple of battery options, 58 kilowatt hour and 77 kilowatt hour, all rear wheel drive. I'm sure most of you know, this is basically an ID3 in a different dress, but many people feel why would you buy an ID3 when you can get one of these? Because they really do look very sharp. The turbine, alloy wheels, the boot spoiler, the red strip along the back, the copper nose, it just looks a bit cooler than its aforementioned baby brother. It's business as usual too for the boot of the E-Boost. It's still 385 litres. Decent enough space, but there's certainly cars on the market today heading into 2024 that have got more space back here. And that's a manually closing boot for 60 grand. <laughs> but you do get a rear wiper and lots of people are leaving these out for some reason. I am delighted to report that the software update has worked. By and large, the bugs have gone. I can even wirelessly charge my mobile device under the armrest and it works. I love the cover here that keeps prying eyes away from things and I love the, the way it's broken up with flashes of copper. I've always said it, the steering wheels are incredible. Uh, I'm kind of getting used to this thing, although at night time it's still an absolute pain in the you know what, that you can't see anything. That is, it's just darkness at night time. And I've really noticed it this time because last time with the car in summertime, now it's the depths of winter and you, you're just gone. Like you do remember in time where that button is, but it's, it's not ideal, really not ideal. Haptic buttons, I'm still, you know, yeah, kind of, still not convinced. I do like the travel assist option. It increases the speed with speed signs. However, there's a couple of times in the M50 today that it said it was 120 and I was not in the 120 zone. Yeah, I was in the 100 zone. And that could get you penalty points if you got caught. Many other ways, this feels like a standard Cupra born inside. Yes, these seats are a bit more special, but you know, I, I'm kind of struggling to see where the extra price is going. It's funny how this car has 230 brake horsepower and it's rear wheel drive, yet it manages to get the power down just nicely. I mean, if you really provoke it, it will, it will start to fishtail for you. Maybe that's kind of part of the fun. Don't get me wrong. Um, much like that, yeah, you can, you can do it, and that's what everything turned on. But generally speaking, in the wet, you floor it, you take advantage of all that electric torque, and you're gone. There's no wheel slipping and any of that carry on. I actually read an article recently just to ask, are electric cars going through tires quicker than previous, you know, fuel methods of cars? and. Well, that's really down to driver behavior, much like if you have a really potent petrol front wheel drive car or rear wheel drive car and you constantly use the power that's available to you, well, yeah, you'll go through tires quicker than normal. I'm seeing this car doing 18 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. It's not a particularly cold December. It's hovering around 10 to 13 degrees, uh, but it's, it's okay. If you're hammering on the motorway, you'll see it doing of 30 so you know again it's up to you you can drive like miss daisy and have lots of range in your cupra born if you wish 
steering is nice and light there's a good bit of feedback from it actually as well i mean you get an idea of where you're pointing the wheels at least and uh, the torque is just brilliant it's, it's always there uh, and it look it could be as i said the looks of the car everything that just contributes to the overall feeling of this is a bit more of a hot hatch version of an ev than you're you might be used to but it is good to drive it's sharp into corners uh, yeah you do feel the weight of it at times you know it's not the lightest car in the world but the fact that it's rear wheel drive as well adds another layer of fun to the car and the brakes are good thankfully when you stand on them they actually do their magic can hear a lot from the outside world at times when larger vehicles go by you i kind of just check in the windows to see are they fully up you know that could have just there's a an extra breeze or something coming through got a bit of that going on still find those pillars as well they're just very large and they do restrict your view at times you're like oh, okay you know now here's the corner that i would normally try and avoid lifting off for there's a couple of twists in it we're on a greasy road and it's still blast through without a problem do i feel as confident when you factor in the weight as you would feel in i don't know a focus rs or a golf gti or a golf or no i will say that i don't there's just more weight underneath you going towards ditches walls and perhaps if you'd never driven those kind of cars in your life you'd be fine with it because you, you wouldn't know any difference but when you've driven things like the Megane RS Trophy Civic Type R it's kind of hard to forget those cars and how they drive and while Cooper have done the best they can to try and recreate that and it is definitely a different experience because of the rear wheel drive you just, I don't know what it is you just don't feel as confident pushing them on and perhaps when EVs get lighter, if that's ever going to be a thing, that feeling of being a little bit over cocky, perhaps, and uh, finding out really if you are a good driver or not, will come back. But definitely comparing it to other petrol hot hatches, and you know, it's not a direct comparison, but this thing is kind of pitched as a hot hatch, then the driving dynamics, they're not the same. They're good, it's very quick in a straight line. I mean, put this up against a Mark V Golf GTI, probably even a Mark VII Golf GTI, and you'll learn quickly about electric torque versus um, you know, petrol car torque or diesel torque. But I don't think we're there yet in matching how connected you feel with the car, if you get me. And as I said, if you've driven those type of cars, you'll understand exactly what I mean. If you haven't, you'll think this is a really fast, cool looking hatch that just happens to be an EV. Um, and the weight really probably won't factor in your mind too much, unless you're coming towards a wall and you're wondering, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have stamped on the pedal so much. First time I drove the Bourne, I thought it just felt a little bit better to drive than the ID3. I still find that the case. Could be in my head. I don't know, it's a sports suspension as well. It just has something extra. It certainly looks a lot better. My main problems are there's bigger cars for this money. It's always been the case. If you think of a hot hatch in petrol form, there was always something else you could spend your money on. That really hasn't changed. But I think what's more obvious these days is the way electric cars are advancing so quickly. I mean, this thing will do 120 kilowatt charging speed, which is still pretty good. Uh, also today on the charge, even when I went past 80%, which is normally where the charging curve really drops down, this thing actually started increasing. And at one point it was doing close to 70 kilowatt charging when it was over 80% state of charge. That's really good, because I got in and out of that charger quicker than I probably would have in a lot of vehicles. It's the extra chunk that really doesn't like 20 whatever it is 26 brake horsepower it's not enough to justify the price just by the standard cooper born the other thing i'm wary of is 
I think 2024 is going to be a bit of a bloodbath when it comes to market share for brands and in turn for you, the consumer, because the price of a car today could be significantly cheaper towards the end of the first quarter of 2024. And that uncertainty right now isn't good for confidence because the list price of this car today is 60,000 euro. Can I say that will still be the case in three months time? No, and nobody really can. And while prices coming down is really great, it kind of just needs to happen. We need a bit of certainty so you can confidently put your money down on whatever version of Cooper Bourne you like. It has been a lesson to me though, how much tech and software is now in cars, because in lots of ways, this has been like driving a different car because all the bugs are gone. Much like you update your phone when you're asleep at night time, electric cars can do that as well. But it would make you think, why did they go wrong in the first place? Anyway, still a cracking car to drive, a sensational car to look at, but there's definitely lots of options out there now for 60,000 euro. So make sure you have a look around. And if you still love the Cooper Born eBoost, go ahead and buy it. Thanks for watching.